Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you uh, today to this midweek video. We appreciate you tuning in as always and being a part of our channel. When we go live from our assembly building on Sunday mornings, as well as when we create content for you here midweek, uh, we would certainly appreciate you ringing the alarm bell and subscribing to become a part of our permanent audience. That would certainly be appreciated. My feature book from now until Easter is my book, Don't Pass Over Easter, A New Defense of Easter in Acts 12.4. And this book deals with the commonly debated uh, passage this time of year in Acts 12.4 regarding Easter. And I believe the King James Bible is correct in its reading of Easter. I believe it's perfectly fine reading. No need to fix it or correct it. But I have a little bit of a different take on why that is than some. So if you haven't check this out, please consider doing so, picking up a copy of the book as a way of supporting the ministry. That'd be much appreciated. Also want to remind you here about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this as an alt tech site should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So if you're into alt tech sites, would like an alternative to YouTube, please check us out here as well. So last week in my midweek video, I did a follow up to part one of my interview with Dwayne Green. Um, and so my video last week on Thursday was a follow-up to part one. And so what I intend to do in this video is to do a follow-up to part two, which was titled Rejecting the Critical Text with a Realistic Position on the King James Version. So before I get into some new stuff, I did want to circle back. If you recall from last week, I had a couple things that didn't really want to work correctly. And one of them, I was talking about the LXX and Luke 4 and whether Jesus was reading from the Septuagint in Luke 4 as an explanation of the discrepancy between Isaiah 61 and Luke 4. And I couldn't get this to load. So here we have in this column Isaiah 61 in the King James. And here we have in this column Luke 4. All right. Now, um, I've, I've bolded any wording differences between them. All right. And you'll notice here that if you look at this comparison, Folks will say, well, the reason this is a quote from the Septuagint is because of this phrase right here and the recovering of sight to the blind. Because if you look at the LXX in this column and the recovery of sight to the blind, it's in the Isaiah 61 reading in the Septuagint, in the LXX. And so they'll say, well, Jesus was reading from the Septuagint there, slam dunk, end of discussion. The problem with that is when you line this up is that this part of the verse that's in Isaiah 61 is not in the Septuagint. And uh, to set at liberty them that are bruised, the corresponding statement in Isaiah 61, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound, it's not in the Septuagint. So the explanation that Jesus is reading the Septuagint to me is completely um, a non-starter because the Septuagint does not satisfy all of the requirements for that to be true. Now, I know that there's debate, possibly, or disagreement about what exactly is going on here. But at the end of the day, Jesus read from a copy of the book of Isaiah. He closed it. He handed it back to the minister. He sat down and he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And yet, when you, when you look at what Isaiah 61 says in the King James with what it says in Luke chapter 4 in the King James, they're not a verbatimly identical match. Yet the Lord Jesus Christ calls it scripture. He never said in the text that he was adding words or an allusion to some other place in the Old Testament. The text doesn't say that. So if you're a textualist, there's words there that Christ calls scripture that he never says he never says where he's quoting them from or adding them from, yet he calls it scripture. So me not being wanting to stray outside of what the text says, the only thing I can conclude there is is to agree with what Christ says, that whatever he read there was scripture, um, and whatever ex unexplainable things there are about that, I have to fall back on what Christ says and his attitude and his belief and opinion about that, okay? Now, another thing that came up in episode one that I wanted to circle back to before I uh, say anything new in this video is some, some stuff about preservation. Um, Brother Green says in the video that the Bible never really tells us how preservation will happen. And then I loosely alluded to the fact that I think the Bible does say more about preservation than people maybe necessarily realize. So in my class from this generation forever, I spent a considerable amount of time talking about this. So in Lesson 47, I talked about the method of preservation. 
And then in lessons 48 through 56, I've talked about the process of preservation. So there's a method of preservation and there's a process that the Bible teaches of how that is going to occur. Now, obviously, I don't have time to cover here nearly 10, 11 hours worth of teaching. So I will leave a link in the description for where you can find these lessons on the method of preservation and the process of preservation. But I did want to scroll down and just sort of show what my summative statements were regarding this in Lesson 56. Okay, So I said that the following scriptural principles will assist the believer in identifying the preserved text. Now, I'm calling these scriptural because I believe they're derived from Scripture, as I proved in the lessons that I'll leave a link to in this description. The first one is a multiplicity of copies. God's design was to preserve his word in a multiplicity of accurate, reliable copies that were just as authoritative as the original. Therefore, we ought to be able to observe in history a collection of manuscripts that are plenteous, that are plenteous in number. That means there's a lot of them <clears throat> in substantive agreement with each other regarding doctrinal content despite not possessing verbatim wording. Second principle, scriptural principle for preservation, is available and accessible. The preserved text would not only exist in a multiplicity of copies, but these copies would be available to God's people to possess, study, believe, and preach from. They would not be hidden under a rock, in the sand, or in an inaccessible library. That's just not the way the scriptures teach you to think about preservation. The idea that it's in a monastery in this remote place in the Sinai Peninsula or that it's in a, a, a library of an established church that, that only certain people who are credentialed can go look at, and that's the identity of the true word of God, is just not the way the Bible would teach you to think about the issue of preservation. And third, a text that is in use. A third biblical mark of the preserved text would be used by God's people for generations from this generation forever, Psalm 12, 6, and 7. God's word was preserved through the dynamic of people handling it, not in one copy on a bookshelf for 500 or 1,000 years. This, that is not the way God preserved his word. He preserves his word by it being in the hands of Bible-believing people, and those people are charged with the responsibility to execute God's purpose. Okay, So when these biblical principles are applied to the historical and textual facts, they point towards the Textus Receptus, the text of the Reformation, as being the printed form of the preserved text. Now, that's a very careful statement. The Textus Receptus is a printed representation of, of the, of the preserved text, okay? The TR is supported by the vast majority of extant Greek manuscripts, the multiplicity of copies. Moreover, it represents a text that was clearly available, accessible, and in use by Bible-believing by Bible people throughout the history of the dispensation of grace, okay? In stark contrast, the critical text supporting Marvin versions fails on all three counts to pass the test of Scripture. Number one, it has few manuscript witnesses that substantively disagree with each other. Number two, its principal manuscripts were not accessible or available to believers throughout the dispensation of grace. I mean, the, the, known, the existence of Codex Vaticanus wasn't even known until the late 15th century, and Codex Sinaiticus wasn't even discovered until the 19th century. Okay, And three, given the lack of availability, they certainly therefore were not used by Bible-believing people during the church age. In fact, Dr. Wilbur Pickering says that they're, they're orphans. They never had any offspring. In other words, nobody copied them or used them, or there's no, no evidence of that ever happening. He calls them eddies, swirling pools, textual pools along the mainstream of textual transmission. If you haven't checked out um, the identity of the New Testament text, you're definitely going to want to do that. Okay. Now, quoting from uh, Taylor's book on the uh, Texas, Decept Texas Receptus, he says, now the crux of the matter is based upon the premise that God has divinely preserved every word that he gave. If we do not believe this, then any discussion concerning the two texts becomes a matter of personal preference based upon man's intellect or will. But since we firmly believe that God has preserved not just basic truths, but not just the general ideas, not just the basic thoughts, but the very words themselves, we must conclude that one text or the other has been corrupted. Okay, so that's that I, I think the Bible does have a lot more to say about preservation than people realize. Okay. Now, as far as new information, so I want to jump into video number one, which is again, does the Bible require letter by letter accuracy? Okay. And around the seven minute, seven second mark, uh, Brother Green asks me here if I'm King James only. Okay. 
So in full transparency, I want to play my answer to that question first, and then I'll offer some more comments. So do you think that there is a need or, or uh, may, maybe not a need, but maybe is there a way to apply this principle to textual criticism? Is that pushing it too far? For, first, you know what, first of all, what, what are your views? Are, are you a King James Version onlyist? Are you a King James Version onlyist? <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard question for me to answer because sure. strictly no. Because I think there's a lot of stuff that has been said under the banner of King James onlyism that I think is just wrong, historically wrong, factually wrong, objectively not true. Okay, so I want to comment there. So I do. There, there are things that are said, arguments in defense of King James onlyism that I think are not correct. All right. There are arguments used to defend King James onlyism that are bad arguments that are not true, that are factually incorrect, and demonstrably so. So if being King James only means that I have to embrace all of that argumentation, then no, I'm not King James only because I, I, I'm not going to embrace an argument in support of a position that is demonstrably false. That doesn't make any sense. So in the strictest sense of the word, I'm answering the question here. I am not King James only if being King James only means that I have to embrace all of the argumentation used to support the King James only position, because I think some of it is not sound reasoning. As far as my usage of a Bible, I exclusively use the King James. I preach from the King James. I teach from the King James. I study from the King James, and I try not to correct the King James when I teach. So I say there that I exclusively use the King James. I study from, teach from, preach from the King James. So I'm exclusively using a King James. So in that sense, am I King James only? Yeah, I suppose I'm King James only in that sense of my use, study, teaching, preaching from the King James. Anything I know about the Bible, I have learned from a King James Bible. Okay. And I said there that I try not to correct it. All right. So. Yep, I said try. Let me rephrase it here. I do not correct it. There are hours and hours of hours of my teaching videos that are online, that are on our website, where I defend the King James readings. I'm, I am critical of critical text readings. I do not correct the King James, okay? I don't, I, that is not my practice. That is not what I do. That is not what I believe, okay? So let me show you a comment that was left here that is prompting this to uh, some degree. And I want to go to my video from last week here. And let's go down here from one of, uh, one of uh, our audience members, Stephen Hayes. He says that he was a little disappointed at your answer to Dwayne's question as to whether you are King James Version only. I understand it's a loaded question, but while your answer made it clear that to use the King James exclusively, you stop short of affirming that you believe it is without error and that any uh, and that other versions are and that other versions are not. It came off sounding like more of a preference than a conviction. I don't know if that was intentional or that or just what happened in the heat of the extemporaneous interview. Not a criticism, just a disappointment. I'm sure I, I I'm not sure I would have done better. So first of all, I appreciate the charity with which Brother Stephen Hayes is dealing with me there. I was not anticipating the question, and so, uh, you know, I, I did fumble around a little bit to answer the question. But my answer to Stephen was this. Sorry for the ambiguity. I did explicitly say in the interview that I don't correct the King James when I teach. I only use the King James Bible, don't think there are any mistakes in it, and believe it contains all the correct readings. That is my position. I've said that consistently. But I reject many of the arguments of so-called King James onlyism to defend it. That is why I said at the beginning of, of Brother Green's question that that was a loaded question. It was loaded because if being King James only means I have to accept all of the argumentation that is used to put forth the King James only position, then no, because I cannot accept some of it because it is factually, demonstrably incorrect. Am I King James only in the sense that I only use, teach, and preach from a King James? 
Do I believe the King James has all the correct readings? In other words, every reading that should be there is there. Every reading that should not be there is not there. Yes. Do I think that there's any mistakes in it? No. In fact, I've gone through hours here on this channel talking about what the translators themselves believed about it and laid all that information out. Okay. So that's the first thing that I wanted to address. The second item that I want to address is from the second video now, um, rejecting the critical text with a realistic position on the King James. Okay. So in this video at around the 10 minute, 33 second mark, Brother Green asks me about my views on revising the King James. Okay. He asked me my views on revising the King James. So let's uh, jump into this video again in full transparency and listen to what I said. The King James Version, uh, if we come back to that, do you think that the King James Version could be revised today to uh, something a little bit more modern, a little bit easier to to digest? Oh, see, now you're here, you go again. You're yeah, get me yeah, in trouble. yeah, yeah, I know I'm going to get you in trouble. <laughs> do I think it can be? Yes, I think it can be. Do I think the new King James is that? I don't know. I have some doubts. Okay. Um, but I will be fully honest and transparent. My studies so far have not taken me into an in-depth, exhaustive study of the New King James. I cannot, in good conscience and in good faith, say yes to something that I haven't looked into with any level of depth. But okay. I do think, in principle, yes, I think that the language could be updated without altering the substance of what's being said. Fair enough. Now, you, you kind of pull on my heartstrings a little bit there, right? So I want to uh, address that, okay? So I was asked about the revision, okay? So first of all, the King James has been revised between 1611 and 1769. The textual evidence and data is overwhelming in favor of this. You should look at Norton's book. You should look at uh, Dr. Lawrence Vance's materials that are coming out that are still in manuscript form. Okay, so things have things have been done to the text of the King James Bible between uh, 1611 and 1769. This this is a fact. Now it may be an inconvenient fact for some. They might not like it. They might be irritated by it or what have you. But it's a fact. It, it to me to me it's indisputable. What are the kinds of things I'm talking about, okay? I'm talking about stuff like um, Jeremiah 46, 4, okay, and put on the brigandines. Jeremiah 51, 3, um, lifted himself up in his brigandine and spare not, spare you not her, the young men, okay? So is there a more modern equivalent of the word brigandine that could be substituted into this verse so that... Um, people would know exactly what this is. Okay. Yeah, I think there is. Um, this, this type of stuff had been going on in the text between 1611 and 1769. When I talk about revising the text and say, and speaking approvingly of that, that's what I'm talking about. Another one would be, okay, I will sweep, I will sweep it with the besom of destruction. Okay. So besom. Okay. Sweep. It, te, you know, contextually, it's it, it's it's kind of clear what it is, but to to say broom there instead of besom, would that alter the, the 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 would that alter the substantive doctrinal content of the verse? No, it wouldn't. So when I talk about revising it, that's what I'm talking about that that kind of thing. And let me just say, okay, if the Anglican Church in in a meeting between 1870, 1871, and 1881 had done only what they said they were going to do to the text of the King James. That is simply update it, similarly to what had been done between 1611 and 1769, and just simply made the kind of changes that I just mentioned, brigandines, besom, and put in more modern equivalent words, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. 
because nobody today in the 19th, nobody in the 20th or 21st century would have had a problem with it because it would have been consistent with what had been going on in the text before that. But the reality is that's not what happened. The Bible, the character of the Bible was fundamentally changed by the introduction of a different Greek text that cascaded then onto massive changes to the English text in the Revised Version that were not what was supposed to be happening given the original parameters of the revision. So, now, what about today? I don't think, while I think it is possible, hear me, it is possible that it could be revised or updated in, in some language usage issues. I'm not calling for it, and I'm fine with it the way it is, and I think that it is intelligible. The majority of it is absolutely 100% intelligible, especially with the aid of dictionaries and, and tools and resources to be understood. Okay? So that's all I was saying. Now, on the matter of the New King James, I said that I had not fully studied the New King James, okay? And that is absolutely true because I don't, I don't use the New King James. I don't use the New King James. I don't, I don't, I don't read it. I don't know all, I don't know what all the readings are. I hear stuff. And this is where I was going with that. Too many times I have simply just taken as gospel the word of leading lights in the King James only movement on different topics, only to find out later that what they had to say wasn't true. So I cannot say that I, I don't I don't want to go with what anyone says about the new King James, good, bad, right, wrong, or indifferent on either side of the issue without having looked at it myself because I just have been burned too many times by taking people's word for it on both sides of this conversation. So I don't have an opinion about it because I haven't studied it. But I will say, when I look at some things in the New King James, it's apparent to me that I have I have problems with it, and I don't think I'll be probably advocating it based upon certain things. Like, for example, Galatians 2.16, knowing that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. The King James here has faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ, okay, that we might be justified by faith in Christ. The new King, or sorry, the King James here has that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. The way the New King James reads here is a circular argument. So it has us being it has us being justified by our faith because of our faith. The King James is teaching something substantively different than that and saying, no, it is our faith resting in the faith of Christ that justifies us. That to me is a major, that, that to me is not verbal equivalence. That is not substantive doctrinal equivalence. Now, I know that Brother Green uses the New King James. I was a guest on his channel. I was trying to be polite and not, uh, you know, unnecessarily rude or anything like that. Um, but these are just some of the things that I've noticed as I have looked at the King, New King James to the extent that I've looked. Another one is Galatians 3.9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave unto me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcision. The King James, as well as the bishops, the Geneva, all prior English Bibles have the gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision, thereby thereby stating two clear and distinct gospels. When I read the New King James, it's obscured. It's not there. So also, just at the surface level, I think there are text critical notes, uh, footnotes in the um, New King James, like at 1 John 5, 7, for example, that call into question the reading uh, in a way that, that I don't doubt or that I don't question. So, yes, I said that I couldn't speak for the New King James in its totality because I cannot. I haven't looked at it enough to know, 
when I do look at it, I see things about it that I'm uncomfortable with because I think they are substantive differences in meaning, which is exactly the principles that we were discussing in the interview. So if I was in any way unclear about those things, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly apologize for them. But those are, those are my uh, positions. And anyone who's followed this channel for any length of time knows that I have been critical of the, arg the, the argumentation that is used in the pro-King James space to support the King James only position. But I have never questioned the King James reading, changed the Queen King James reading, said that a better reading would be, this is wrong, it should read that. I don't do that because I don't believe that. I believe the King James contains all the correct readings. And I believe that it doesn't report anything that's false. And I'm not aware of any translational mistakes in it that misrepresent the meaning of the original text. Which, by the way, is exactly what the translators said they did. As I've demonstrated in my series, did the King James translators believe... I'm, I'm getting that title wrong now that I'm... Now that I'm saying that, so let's just uh, make sure we can clarify the title of that series for you. And I'll leave a link in the description here. Um, so I'm trying to load the playlists. And let's see, this series right here, did the King James translators view their work as perfect, is the series that I'm meaning to mention there. So um, those are just some thoughts on uh, the second part of my interview with um, Brother Green. Um, and again, I appreciate um, him having me on. I appreciate him uh, asking me the questions. Um, if I did not answer to the satisfaction of some, uh, I would just ask Grace that, that my answers here could be uh, taken into context of the totality of everything that I've said about this issue. So that is the end, uh, I suppose, of my video for uh, this week. Now, listen, guys, if you want, if you want to study my class um, from this generation forever, you have a couple different formats to do that in. One is this blog spot that I need to update because I'm a little bit behind on the updating of this. But I list all the lessons here on this blog spot. And a second option that you have, if you want to go through this information, and I'm right now in a very detailed study of Miles Smith's preface to the King James Bible. Uh, I just taught last Sunday, a couple days ago, lesson, uh, whoops, it's not what I wanted. I just taught lesson 198, and you can check that out right here, lesson 198. And if you click, and I'll leave a link in the description again for this video, where you can get the format of the church website. And again, all of the studies on the website, all 198 of them have video, audio, and PDF notes to go with them so that you can study through this information. So those are my thoughts, my follow-ups. Again, I appreciate Brother Green for having me on. And listen, as always, the most important thing that you will ever decide in your life is the issue of your eternal state. Jesus Christ, God loves you. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the cross to die for your sin. He shed his blood for you there on the cross. And he's offering you eternal life as a free gift when you will trust and rely exclusively on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the only total payment for your sin. He shed his blood for you there on the cross. He was delivered for your offenses. He was raised again for your justification. And when you believe and trust in that and that alone, God will give you eternal life as a free gift. He'll take you out of Adam. He'll put you into Christ. He'll take you out from under the power of darkness and translate you into the kingdom of his dear son. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late.